Hey everyone, the VC is Matt, and it's been a while, but I'm back with yet another Beach Boys review and uh, going in chronological order. And so we get uh, to this album, some glare on there from the shrink wrap, but the Beach Boys MIU, which uh, came out in October 2nd of 1978. There's the cover. Until I got this album for the longest time, I didn't know what that was, but it's a shot of a wave that someone took with the sun coming up, I guess, in the morning on the ocean there. And then, uh, not the most imaginative cover, kind of a dull, boring tan or brown cover there. There's a shot of the band on the back there, so about as exciting as it gets. The inner sleeve has the lyrics on one side and just the album credits on the second side so yeah this is uh as i've said over and over through this i sort of started these beach boy reviews about what's been probably two years ago just for my own uh, edification and fun more than anything i wanted to see i knew the hits and i knew pet sounds and that's pretty much it so i wanted to see if in fact they were was more to the band than that if they're were good album tracks and good songs that weren't hits weren't known and I found out that there's quite a bit of great stuff that was never uh, released as a single or got airplay some things that were released as singles but just didn't get any attention and uh, there's uh, quite a bit of goodness there outside of the hits that everyone knows and up to this point I've pretty much to varying degrees liked all of the albums from the first one up to Love You, uh, I guess 15 big ones, the 1976 album before Love You, I was probably my least favorite of the bunch so far, and that one's hardly great, but I, I like it okay. From what I did know about the band, and I've learned a lot since I've been going through this and, and listening to these albums and getting to know them and reading up, learning more about the band, was the general feeling was um, a lot of people thought that uh, uh, Holland was kind of their great last great record. Others feel that Love You is their last great record, the one from 77, which is the last one I reviewed. And then the general consensus is that it just sort of nosedives at that point, and they become kind of not very good, and... and um, sort of irrelevant at that point um, and I really wasn't looking forward to I liked Love You a lot I gave that a good review uh, I also found out as I've said that there's a lot more to the Beach Boys past Pet Sounds that that period from Pet Sounds uh, or I guess Smiley Smile up through Love You has, uh, has a lot of a lot of really good stuff in there that's worth checking out and stuff that you're never gonna hear on the radio uh, but anyway, as I was approaching MIU, this is kind of thought to be by many the first of their just sort of junk, not very good albums, and the decline sets in rapidly from this point and onward, so it goes. I wasn't looking forward to this album. I had to buy it because I didn't have a copy of it. I'd never heard it before. There's none of the None of the songs on here that when I got it that were familiar that I'd ever remembered hearing on the radio. So I was a bit of trepidation going into this. And, um, but we'll see how that went. First of all, let's get some, uh, MIU stands for Maharishi Institute University, which was a, a meditation study center or college, or maybe it's still around in Fairfield, Iowa, of all places, which is kind of strange for something like that, but Mike Love, of course, had gone to India with the Beatles, which I'm sure they were thrilled to have him along uh, in 68, 67, 68, whenever that was, and he apparently stuck with the whole meditation, transcendental meditation thing, and still does it to this day. Um, kind of funny to be doing something related to the Maharishi in 1978, like 10 years after he was a thing, but that's Mac Love for you. Um, so anyway, uh, the reason it's in my IU University is that I'm 
big chunk of this album was recorded there in Fairfield, Iowa. Uh, why they wanted to pick up and go to Iowa instead of Los Angeles, who knows, but that was kind of Mike Love's idea and the rest of the band went along with it. So, October 2nd, 1978, this came out, as I said, shot all the way to number 151 on the United States charts and completely missed the chart, didn't chart at all in England, which is strange. It's the first of their albums since 1964 to not chart in England. And the odd thing about it is, is all these great albums after Pet Sounds, uh, Sunflower, Wild Honey, uh, Carl and the Passions, etc., etc., most of those charted better in England than they did in the United States. So here you got a reversal where it, I mean, I, I can't call number 151 good at all, but didn't chart at all in England. Uh, it's a very tumultuous time for the band, and after Love You, they were uh, more and more, they weren't selling, they weren't, you know, what they were popularity-wise back in the 60s by any, by any means this late in the game in the, in the late 70s. The band was pretty close to breaking up, not getting along that well. Brian had produced Love You, great album. They wanted him to produce what became this album, but he was sort of sliding back into depression, mental problems, and drug use, and basically, sadly, was unable to, uh, to do so. And uh, Carl and Dennis were fighting with the rest of the band. They didn't like this album. They didn't, or they didn't like the direction the band was going in and what became this album. So they're barely even on this album. They are on a few songs, but very little. The nucleus of the band really is Brian, Mike Love, and Al Jardine. And there's some session players, I'm sure, that fill things out as far as the music. Uh, Dennis was busy with his only solo album that was released during his lifetime, Pacific Ocean Blue, at the time this was going on, around about that time. This album has a very long, convoluted uh, lineage as to how it became the MIU album. The band was on Warner uh, or Reprise or Reprise Records. They would uh, go over, this would be their last album on that label and after that their next album would be on and I forgot to write that down it's what Sony music now but it's uh, I think Columbia is what it was at the time so this started off as something that was going to be called an album uh, excuse me something that was gonna be called adult child and Brian apparently and there's bootlegs of it I haven't heard it but Brian did a lot of music wrote a lot of songs and music for what was to become Adult Child. The label Reprise rejected that as not commercial enough. Uh, what they got really wasn't, didn't turn out to be that commercial either, but but anyway, uh, so that was rejected and never released. Some of the songs off of what, have been, what would have been Adult Child, I think one of them ended up on this album and uh, one or uh, a couple others ended up on some subsequent albums. Some of the other songs have never been released, at least not officially. Uh, they are out there on bootlegs, I've, I've heard. So, Adult Child didn't happen. And um, then the next thing was, uh, and I'm not sure if I've got the chronology right of when, which album was being recorded. Late 77, the band decided, and I, I think this was um, a Mike Love move, to record another Christmas album. Of course, the band had had the, the classic Beach Boys Christmas album back in 1964 that you still hear on the radio every every holiday season. I did a review on that way back when, because I'm going in order here. I uh, I don't know if I gave that that great of a review, but my opinion of that album's gone up somewhat. And that's the thing about reviewing albums is sometimes you look back and you like them more than you did the first time you initially reviewed them. Sometimes you like them less, but uh, anyway, the, you, you know the classic 64 Beach Boys album, uh, Little Saint Nick and, and uh, Santa Claus Coming to Town, all that stuff. So 77 they decided to do another Christmas album and this was not, as far as I know, 
Yeah, I think with, well, I don't, I don't think so. Maybe one or two exceptions. This was not just recordings of your uh, Christmas songs everyone knows. Everyone does Christmas albums with Oh Come All You Faithful, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Frosty the Snowman. This was Christmas songs, original Christmas songs that the band wrote. So they submitted that to the label. The label said, we don't want a Christmas album. We want an album of just regular songs. So some of the songs on MIU are actually those Christmas songs. And I know this gets confusing. Those Christmas songs with new lyrics, kind of the same music, but new lyrics to make them regular songs instead of Christmas songs. So they started work on a new album. That album was supposed to be called California Feeling which uh, California, Fe California Feeling was a song that Brian had written back around 1975. So they did some work on that, and some of those songs are probably on MIU. Brian, for whatever reason, decided not to let him use the song California Feeling once everything was said and done, and so it's not on this album. I don't know if that song was ever released or not, or ever bootlegged or not, I'm not sure. And so they did some more recording and some more changing things around and eventually this is what became of it so uh, yeah they wanted Brian to produce as I said that didn't work out because of problems he was having at the time so Al Jardine and somebody named Ron Altbach ended up producing the album Brian was given and is given an executive producer credit on the album though um, whether he actually ever really did much of anything. He's Brian, so he probably had his hand in there some, some way or another. But how much he actually did is, is up for debate and not really, not really known. So, um, yeah. Um, one of the songs on here, too, was originally produced by Brian for 15 big ones, but I guess they didn't have room to put it on the album, so it shows up here. But uh, And that song, and we'll get to it when we talk about song by song here, Al Jardine sort of reworked it for the version on MIU, so the, the original version that Brian produced that was intended for 15 big ones that ended up on here is actually a different version, and like I said, it's kind of a convoluted, confusing thing. Anyway, so, yeah, like I said, I was not really looking forward to this album, or was, at least I was expecting a really pretty bad, awful album. Some of the reviews at the time, uh, one one reviewer said it's kind of a retrograde salute of a band playing into their own mythology. Another reviewer called it dreadful and pitiful. Rolling Stone um, described it as contrived and artificial. They say that it was a an attempt to recapture the dreamy adolescence innocence uh, innocence of the Beach Boys earlier days. It has a melancholy feel to it because it seems as if they realize that they've outgrown this sort of thing, but they just stuck and don't know what else to do. And uh, certainly with what was going on in 1978, well, disco was big and all, and you still had sort of uh, what we call classic rock now, but the current rock then, and, and uh, the Billy Joels and stuff, but then you had punk and new wave and a lot of stuff going on, and this really doesn't fit in with the times of 1978 so it's it's easy to see why this didn't get a lot of airplay and didn't do too well commercially um what else dennis wilson who as i said had very little to do with this album called it later on he called it an embarrassment that should self-destruct he said the, he hopes the karma of it f's up mike loves meditation forever I always like dennis so um Brian in 1995 said he couldn't even remember making the album, which is pretty sad and um, a shame there. And Giggins, who's also a VC member here, he does a lot of Beach Boys reviews, probably knows a whole lot more about the band. I don't know probably about it. He knows a lot more about the band than I do. And he does Beach Boys. He does other people uh, reviews, talks about other albums too. But he's a huge Beach Boys fan, and he did a video reviewing this, and he... Did, didn't like it much. So, like I said, I was expecting the worst and um, was, I don't know, pleasantly or whatever, but I was surprised when I actually found myself kind of liking it. 
sort of, and I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's just go through the songs real quick. There's 12 songs here. The first song on side one is She's Got Rhythm. It's written by Brian, Mike Love, and this Ron Altback character. Brian sings lead. Uh, it's a it's a upbeat kind of fun opener, swings a little bit. It's, it's, it's a it's a nice song. It's kind of a '70s type version of '60s Beach Boy harmonies, sort of updated for the '70s, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But this song it's 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 nice. It's good. I'm gonna give that a seven. The song two on side one is "Come Go with Me." which is the old Del Viking song from uh, 1957. Their version got to number four on the charts. So the old doo-wop group, and you probably all heard that song on on oldies radio, or if you like the old doo-wop stuff. It, um, the, again, by this point in time, a band like the Beach Boys, uh, there's really no need for them to be doing cover songs. It's, it's not 1963 or four anymore. So it's, um, and I've, uh, my thoughts on cover versions, I'm not a huge fan of them with some exceptions, but, uh, for that, they do a okay version of it. I don't, um, uh, they do an okay version of it. I guess uh, I was never that, the original song by the Dell Vikings is okay. It's a good song, I guess. I was never a fan of it per se, one way or the other, uh, Theirs isn't as good as the Dell Vikings, but it's nice enough. I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a five on a one to ten scale. This was not a 45 at the time in 1978, but in 1982, a compilation album by the Beach Boys called Ten Years of Harmony was released, and this was included on that album. It was released as a single in 1982, and it got to number 18 on the charts. Um, but I don't remember ever hearing the Beach Boys version. I never heard it on the radio or anything. Third song on side one is called Hey Little Tomboy. It's written by Brian, uh, Love, uh, Mike Love and Brian and Carl Wilson share vocal duties on this. This is one of the few appearances by Carl on the album. Uh, this was a song that was, uh, would have been included in the Adult Child album, apparently. And uh, it's a strange, it's talking about, hey, little tomboy, come sit on my lap, put away your skateboard, time to grow up. So considering the fact that the maybe if they'd have done this in 1962 or three when they were all 18, 19, and Carl was like 15 years old, might have worked then. But in 1978, these guys are in their what, mid to late 30s or whatever. It's a little bit creepy. One one reviewer called it the most unsettling moment of the Beach Boys' career. And I'm not insinuating that, well, Mike Love maybe, but Brian, I don't think he's some kind of pervert pedophile or anything like that, but it's just a unfortunate choice of lyrics, I guess. Uh, he had talked about the song saying it was just about how you'd see uh, girls growing up that were kind of the tomboy or the uh, ugly duckling and then four or five years later they a beautiful girl all of a sudden so I think his intentions were innocent it's just comes off a little uh, and um, musically I mean it's okay it, it's just um, eh. but I guess just based musically I'll give it a, a, a five so we go to song number four on side one which is called Kona Coast uh, this was written by uh, Al and Mike Love, and they both share the vocal duties on it. I kind of think of this as a uh, early but much, much better version of Kokomo, a hit they would have, uh, what, 10, 10 years later. Uh, one of the worst songs ever, and one of their worst songs, and worst terrible song, Kokomo. This is much better than that, and it's the same. Uh, that's about being out on the tropical islands and all, and this is just sort of a a uh, travelogue of Hawaii. Uh, kind of has an, uh, has this, it's a catchy song. It's got really nice harmonies. It's not California girls quality, but it does sort of recall the Beach Boys of, you know, the 60s. Um, and uh, kind of made me think of the kink song Holiday in Waikiki on Face to Face, which is also a better song than this. 
But this is a catchy song. It's just it's nice musically. Uh, probably the best song on side one. I'm going to give that one an eight. The fifth song is um, Peggy Sue. Of course, that was written by Buddy Holly, Jerry Allison, and Norman Petty. It was a big hit for Buddy Holly. Great song by Buddy Holly. Al Jardine sings this version. I've never heard the Beach Boys version again. Again, ditto what I've said about covers, but... Uh, you know, the Beach Boys, they do a pretty good version of it. I'll give it a 7. It's, it's Buddy Holly's is better, obviously, or at least in my opinion, but I'll give it a 7. Uh, side 1 wraps up with uh, song number 6, which is called Once You Come Out Tonight. That was written by Brian and Mike. They uh, share the vocal duties again. kind of starts off as a doo-wop song, then goes into ballad mold, mode. It's a it's a wistful wisp, wistful can't talk today wistful easygoing summer sounding song. Uh, it's uh, got a it's just nice, but then it quickly gets boring. But then toward the end, they sort of have some harmony and stuff, and it's got a nice little wrap up at the end that that sort of redeems the song somewhat. It's just not a great song one way or the other. But I'm going to give it a six. It's 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 a nice one. So we go on to side two. Um, side two opens with a song, the first song, Sweet Sunday Kind of Love, which was written by Brian and Mike. Carl sings it, and I think this is the second and pretty much the last only time he shows up on the album. It's got a good vocal by Carl. Carl's probably the best singer in the band, or was, I guess. He's... Um, so it's always good to hear Carl sing. He's a great singer. Basically, it's it's uh, kind of an adult contemporary sounding thing, though. It's just it's pleasant, but there's not much to it. I'm going to give it a five. Number two song is called Bells of Paris. Uh, bells is in a woman, not bells is in ding dong. Uh, written by Brian and Mike and that altback guy. Uh, Mike Love sings the lead vocal. There's a backup, though. It's got some really cool harmonies it doesn't really sound beach boys which is interesting because there's nothing on this album that's uh, uh groundbreaking or or you know um innovative or anything as there had been on beach boys albums to this point not much but this song's a little bit something different it doesn't sound much like the beach boys uh love sort of sings sort of sounds like uh serge Gain gainsburg uh he would uh the french singer you all might have heard of uh, Jatame, he did with Jane Birkin, which is a great song, went to number one in England in 1969, I think. He sort of sounds like Serge, uh, not really maybe, but uh, at least sort of uh, brings Serge Gainsbourg's vocal style to mind. It's kind of a travelogue of Paris, just as... Uh, just as Kona had been a travelogue of Hawaii, Kona Coast had been a travelogue of Hawaii. It's an interesting, little bit of a different thing. Kind of sticks out on this album in a good way. I'm going to give that a seven. Third song on side two is called Pitter Patter. Uh, Brian, Mike Love, and Al Jardine wrote it. Love and Jardine sing it. Uh, it's kind of a back to the Beach Boys sound. This album, this song could have been a could have been a minor song on something like Sunflower or Carl and the Passions or friends or something it would have fit in nice on there it's catchy it's melodic i'm going to give that one an eight we go to song number four on side two which is called my diane written by brian oddly enough it's sung by dennis and this is a uh, uh, dennis plays drums I'm, I'm not sure if he plays on all songs on this album but he plays at least a little bit here and there this is his only vocal and i don't know if he's even on any of the backing vocals on the rest of the songs but he sings lead vocal which is um, which is a, a, a puzzling decision there because this is about the time that Brian and his wife Diane were splitting up and getting divorced or about to get divorced. So kind of kind of weird that such a personal song from Brian he would choose his brother to sing it. Anyway, it's a it's a song full of contrast because you've got these really soaring uplifting harmonies in the song that belie the sad and mournful and depressing um, lyrics you know somebody's heartbroken that they lost their love of their life their wife uh, it's hardly cheerful 
uh, lyric wise, but it's a really good song and I'm going to give it an eight and uh, there's that. So I don't know if it's something you'd want to go out of your way to listen to that much, but it, it is a uh, quite a good song and it, it might be that or Kona Coast probably be the best song of the album. One of those two. Uh, this one's a little bit more substance to it than Kona Coast, so I guess that would be uh, number five song on side two is Match Point of Our Love. That's written by Brian and Mike. Brian sings it. It's a nice vocal. It's pleasant. It's kind of that 1977-78 adult contemporary smooth rock sound to it, which I've never been a fan of. Kind of a Jimmy Buffett, Pablo Cruz sounding thing. So I'm going to give it a five for right now, but the thing is, I was listening to it a couple of times, a few times since I played this. I wasn't familiar with this album, so I played it a handful of times to get familiar with it. kind of sounds like one of those songs that, not the kind of thing you like, but you find yourself listening to it for some reason, so it might grow on me. It's not a great song, but for now I'm going to give it a five. And uh, the album ends with a song called Winds of Change, which was written by nobody in the Beach Boys. It was written by that Altbach guy and some guy named Ed T Tallulah, Tallula, Tahula, something like that. And those two guys were in a band together back in the early 70s, and I can't remember the name of them. I forgot to write it down. <clears throat> anyway, but Al Jardine and Mike Love sing the song. It's a piano based song with orchestration, kind of a nice, pretty thing. It, I don't know, but I'm just guessing that. They were sort of going for shooting for the big, lush uh, uh, ballad sort of uh, production statement song, something along the lines of Let It Be or Bridge Over Troubled Water or maybe even you know, Candle in the Wind. That sort of thing is what they were shooting for. They don't quite make it, but it's, it's a pretty good song. And um, good piano, good orchestration, nice vocals. And so I'm going to give that a 6.5. Overall, I'm going to give this album, I don't know, 6.5 sounds good. We'll just go with that overall, which probably be a little bit generous on my fault, on my part. So yeah, um, like I said, I was surprised that I actually kind of like this. But I will say this. I mean, if, if they'd taken the year off and not recorded an album in 78, if this didn't exist, it really wouldn't matter one way or another. There's nothing essential here. There's no there's no knockout whammy standout track on here which that uh, every Beach Boys album to this point had had at least a couple of you know really standout tracks. Maybe not so much 15 big ones but uh, everything else. That's um, this would be for diehard Beach Boys fans only if you just gotta have everything the band ever recorded. If you're new to the band or you're a casual fan, you can probably just pretend this thing never existed. You're not missing anything if you never heard it. And uh, even if you're a diehard Beach Boys fan, get their good albums before you go out and spend money on this. But, and it, I guess it's sort of like a background music album. I think I'll probably play it in the future I'm not going to just put it on the shelf and forget about it I'll probably pull it out and play it every once in a while but for intense listening not for that just for uh, if I'm just doing stuff around the house folding clothes or laundry or cleaning out the desk drawer or something just some background music it's uh, it's an album that doesn't need to exist but it's not as bad as I was expecting it to be and as some of the reviews it's 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 not good by any means I'm not saying that and 6.5 really I mean it should probably be more like a 4 maybe 3.5 or a 4 to be realistic but I, I don't know I kinda it's it's pleasant and I'll probably play it some it's it's not uh, of course the the albums that came before this are, are much better and uh, way 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 better so that's it. Um, as far as that Christmas album that was supposed to come out, that they started in 77, um, we've got a price tag there, Beach Boys Ultimate Christmas. This came out in 1998, and this is a, is a one CD, yeah, one CD set, and it has their, um, 
has their 1964 Christmas album, and then they had done some other Christmas singles in 63 and I think 69, and they did one in 74, but it has the 77, what would have been the 77 Christmas album songs on here, and I don't think they had ever been released until this point, other than on bootleg, I guess. I'll do a separate review on this because uh, this has already gone way too long. But, um, yeah, and even though this didn't come out in 1998, I'll probably do this one next before I do chronologically the next Beach Boys album is L.A. or Light album, which came out in 1979, and I'll be doing that. But since this is kind of tied to the M.I.U. album, and look at love there. Doesn't he look like some homeless guy you'd see out there on sleeping by the dumpster on Lancaster Street. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll do this one next. Uh, so, as if we haven't already gone long enough, I thought I would um, just end this, and if you just, uh, you know, some recent pickups, just to go through real fast. Uh, this is much better than MIU. This came out uh, just last week, I think, and it's called Sunshine Tomorrow, 1967, The Beach Boys, and this collects has the first true stereo remaster or version of Wild Honey, a great album. I did a review on that several albums back. And it's got some demos and outtakes from Wild Honey. It's got some songs that they recorded about that time that ended up on subsequent albums. And it's got some demos from Smiley Smile and um, great, great, great thing. It's a two-disc set. And I have not really listened to the, the second disc. I've listened to it once. But uh, some Smiley Smile outtakes, and then it's got, they were going to do a live album called Laid in Hawaii, which is kind of like you put a lay around your neck, not like a you know, stupid uh, pun there. But uh, it's going to be called Laid in Hawaii, and that ended up not coming out. They recorded the couple of concerts over there, and didn't like the results, but that, that album or those songs are here, and they subsequently did some songs in the studio we're going to try to pass it off as a live album and yada 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 but anyway i listened to the second disc uh, only once or twice it's pretty good it's not as good as the first disc but i i gotta listen to the second one a few more times to really say but if you're a beach boys fan and this didn't come out on vinyl as far as i know it only came out on cd if you like the beach boys this is this is a really good stuff so you definitely want to pick that up the other thing i got oh i guess a week or so before and that's got a bunch of glare on it, is a uh, three CDs and one DVD, Purple Rain Anniversary, well, it's not really the anniversary, I don't know why, it's just, it just came out now, but anyway, it's out. Remastered album, and the second disc has some unreleased stuff, and the third disc has the singles and the B-sides of uh, things that weren't on the album, and then the DVD is a live concert from 1985. So, uh, uh, glad to have this again. I hadn't had, uh, I had this on vinyl. I don't anymore, and I used to have it on cassette. And, of course, I don't have that anymore. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm not going to get into reviewing this right now, other than to say this is probably, well, i uh, I'll save that for later, but uh, it's been a lot of fun listening to this the last, uh, I've been, these have been the two things I've been playing in my car going to work last uh, week or so here, but because um, in 1984, 85, maybe in 86 into, just played this thing to death on a uh, record player at home and then cassette in the car and just listened to it over and over, and so even though I've heard this, the songs off of this off and on in the years since, I haven't. It's been a long time since I'd really sat down and listened to the album front to back, years, really, decades, because I just knew it inside out. And kind of like Sgt. Pepper, I'd been, I'd been playing that the, the few weeks before I got these two. And so it was really fun to hear this, just to remind yourself of what an incredible, great album this is. Um, so, yeah. And uh, two other things real quick. I also got... And the Prince thing only came out on CD. I mean, of course, you can get Purple Rain on vinyl, but um, I did get this on vinyl, which is good to have. Another incredible album. This is the album before Purple Rain from 1982. And this is cool to finally have on vinyl because I had 
back in the eighties, I had all the Prince albums up through uh, Sign of the Times, I think, on vinyl. Uh, with the exception of this, I never never had this on vinyl. I had it on a cassette in my car, played it to death, and then later, I guess, late eighties, mid late eighties, I got it on CD, and the CD. I think the cassette had everything on it. The CD cut out DMSR and maybe one of the other songs for Space, I guess, because this is a double album. They put it on a single CD. So it's good to have the album and you get the entire thing and to have it on vinyl because I just never picked it up back in the 80s on vinyl for some reason. So it's very nice to finally have it that way. And uh, again, an incredible, incredible album. And here's a band probably bunch of you may never have heard of orange juice and this is you can't hide your love forever kind of a goofy silly cover granted but uh this is from 1982 the band only ever made four albums they made two in 1982 and i think one in 83 and their last one in 84 um i'd heard of this band never heard them a few record store three or four two or three record store days ago they released um uh, their albums on vinyl for the first time in forever and uh, I didn't pick them up but uh, was potential video I want to do and I ran across them and I thought you know give them a shot and I went to YouTube and listened to some of their music ended up buying this album I'm gonna get their other three guy they didn't they're from Scotland they had I think one top 40 hit in England in 1983 and uh, I think their album, a couple of their albums might have hit the top 40 or 50 in England, did nothing in America, and they broke up uh, around 84. Ed, Edwin Collins, the main guy, he went on, I think he's still around and makes solo albums. He had a, a hit single in the 90s, which I can't remember the name of now, but when I read that, I looked it up on YouTube, and I was like, okay, I've heard that before, uh, which is it's an okay song, but... Uh, this, incredible. This is just great, great. And I, I don't have anything else by them, but I'm going to get their other three albums. I've, I've listened to them on YouTube, and they're just as good. And uh, if you like that 80s, that 81, 82, 83 kind of MTV punk pop new wave sound, then you're really going to like these guys, I think. Uh, get, go, to, go to YouTube and just check out orange juice uh, just bring that up you can listen to the whole album give it a shot so i'll probably do some reviews on that stuff but that's that uh i'll be back later and hope everyone has a good weekend hope it's not as hot where you are as it is in texas and take care